This episode is a little bit different to my normal how-to format. Sometimes it's a good idea to stop just looking at how we do things and also think about why we do them. This episode is a collaboration with my good friend Chris Fryer. He's going to upload a version of it to his channel, I'm uploading a version of it to mine. But straight after this I've got another video coming up which is all about um, Sonoff free flashing and then I've got one about software coming up. So there'll be a lot more technical content straight after this. But um, I think this is really important because it can show, it shows the, um, the real benefits that automation technology can bring to people's lives. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer. Doug Chris. And this is Superhouse. Is it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Chris and his identical twin brother Nick for about 20 years now. Um, in fact, way back when, uh, Chris and Nick worked for me as programmers at my software company. And for about the last year or so, I've been working with Nick and Chris on a variety of projects related to um, using technology to make their lives easier. Now, unfortunately, Nick passed away about two months ago, but I've been continuing with those projects with Chris. A lot of the time when people hear that I work on home automation systems, they say that's just toys for rich, lazy people. But when you see the difference that it can make in the life of someone who doesn't have the same uh, physical mobility uh, as I do, it really makes all of that sort of thing worthwhile. Yes. So what we're going to do today is look at a couple of the projects that we've been working on and not go into them in great detail we can follow up with later videos about that, but just show some of the things that you can do using open source technology and um, home automation, Arduino, and all of those sorts of related things. Definitely. And, um, and see what sort of a difference it can make in people's lives. Um, now, a lot of the motivation for this as well is that products that are specifically designed for assistive uh, purposes can be extremely expensive, they can be proprietary, so closed, and you really can't modify them to make them suit individual uh, situations. So, um, Chris, you've got, just as an example of the sort of numbers we're talking about, you got this wheelchair fairly recently, it was last year sometime. How much was this wheelchair? $45,000. Yeah, well, obviously there's a lot of engineering in a wheelchair, but $45,000. I mean, you can buy a really nice car for $45,000. So things that are required just for general day-to-day -day life can be really expensive. By doing everything in an open way, it means that things can be customised. It's not just buy a device and then use it as it was originally designed. With open source, of course, you can remix, you can modify, and you can make things really suit um, an individual needs. So one of the projects that Nick and Chris worked on over quite a number of years is a little thing called a button box, which has got um, switches that they can press that then send keystrokes to the computer and that can be used for things like gaming or controlling um, software like Fusion 360. So what sort of things do you use that for? Play games. Mm -hmm. Mostly. Yeah. Cool. And but but uh, it's most uh, useful with CAD software. Yeah. Such as Fusion 360, Blender, and also the pretty quick type of the bottom box helps with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be screwed with that, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. Yeah, and the, um, the button box is a really good example of 
uh, a sort of device that needs to be customized to suit the individual because the individual buttons need to be tuned in terms of how much force is required to activate them and the physical position of the user's hand. Now, it's not possible to make a single device that is going to suit everybody's hand and everybody's mobility. So by doing this in an open way, it means that people can tune it to suit themselves. This is connected through to an Arduino Leonardo, which is in this box. The Leonardo can then emulate a keyboard or um, a game controller, so that by uh, using these switches, Chris can send either individual key presses or uh, they could be even strings of characters, basically whatever you want to program into it. And this is designed to just sit over the edge of the tray of the, um, the wheelchair. And because um, people have different size hands and different strength in their hands, this part of it needs to be customized to suit the individual. So you can see the pads here adjust the, the height. Now this particular button box is really old. This was made quite a few years ago and it was a prototype that was built. Um, but Chris liked this one so much that he's just kept using it. And you can see that it's been modified. It's had extensions glued on here. So the original um, length of the little switch just came up to here and then it's been brought out and padded up. And just recently we modified it by cutting out the edge of this mounting uh, base here and uh, Peter attached this little switch so that that can work on the thumb. Originally it just had four switches here for fingers, but now it's got a thumb switch as well. My brother did. This was a switch. Fed. Tugabs. Blacktop. Need for speed. And, um, toy racing. But to be competitive, she needed proportional control to the steering and acceleration. Mm. And, um, She could use the mouse for steering, but he still had difficulty accelerating mm. smoothly. Yeah, yeah, because when you map one of these to say throttle and brake, it's just on and off control. There's no proportional um, output. So one of the things that we've just been looking at, and we haven't actually done this yet, <clears throat> is using these tiny little um, strain gauges. And what we're thinking of doing is making an updated version of the button box, which instead of having these micro switches, which is just on and off, we're going to mount these little strain gauges and that will allow proportional control which will be really useful for things like racing games but it could also be useful for other things as well there are a lot of times when you don't want to just have on off control of a computer you want to be able to control something proportionally because this particular button box was custom made it's very laborious both in terms of making the the physical structure of the inputs but also the controller. At the moment, this is an Arduino Leonardo with a whole lot of hand wire connections inside this box. So to make that easier, I designed this little shield, which basically just provides a breakout for some of the I.O. and ground and power. So what you can do is take something like an Arduino Leonardo, plug this shield into it, and then that provides an input for a device like this. So it saves a lot of the messing around with wiring and lets you focus on just the mechanical part of the controller itself. But I've also been working on another little device. Now you've probably heard of the Xbox Adaptive Controller from Microsoft. This is a controller that provides a number of large easy to use inputs.
but it also has a row of 3.5 millimeter sockets on the back. So the idea is that you can build your own custom uh, game controller by using whatever buttons you want, or it might be things like foot controls, or it might be like a, a SIP controller, or it could be chin control. It doesn't really matter. As long as you've got something that can provide switched outputs, you plug it into the adaptive controller, plug this into your game system or computer, and then you can trigger all of the normal actions that you would on a game controller. So as far as the console is concerned, you've just plugged in a normal controller. So what we wanted to do was something similar to that, but open source, smaller and cheaper. So we've just been working on this, which is the mini open adaptive controller. Um, it's a lot smaller than the, the Xbox adaptive controller because it doesn't incorporate the controls on it directly. What it provides is a series of eight inputs in a similar sort of way, 3.5 millimeter stereo, oh sorry, mono sockets. So you can just plug in switches or buttons or touch switches or whatever you want to use. It's got USB-C on it and it has an 80 mega 32U4, which is the same as the Arduino Leonardo. So the idea is that with this, you can plug it into your computer, plug in whatever input devices you like and build your own custom controller. Uh, there's also going to be a little OLED on here so that we can do things like have different modes. So what Chris does at the moment is on the Leonardo, which is running in here, it's running a program which reads from these switches and then sends different events to the computer depending on what mode it's in. For example, there is a mode for playing certain games. Um, there is a mode for Fusion 360 that sends commands that are relevant to that. And the, um, the sketch has to be updated on here in order to change the mode. So what we want to do is streamline that process and make it really easy to define your own custom modes and specify what you want the key events to be and then be able to switch between modes very easily. These are touch switches. They make it easy for me to control my wheelchair. For example, this button switch modes so I can do things like this or to this switch to the back to the SB to do purchase click to the stuff like that take photos play games whatever it's extremely useful uh, and without it I wouldn't be able to use my phone so it's a huge thing for me but uh, there's a few issues these particular touch switches are powered from little coin cell batteries and that makes it very convenient for installation because they're self-contained. You just plug the output into the, the wheelchair and it all works. The big problem is that the batteries in them only last about a month. And if you've got a couple of them on your chair, it means that you're constantly replacing batteries. And even worse than that, replacing the batteries isn't easy. It's not like a little case where you can clip open a cover, slide a battery out and slide another one in. The case is actually screwed closed. So if Chris is out somewhere, um, he might be away from home or, you know, going to the movies or something, and the battery at that particular point goes flat, then whoever is with him has to use a screwdriver to take the case apart to replace the battery, which they probably don't even have with them. Yes. So it's really inconvenient. And when that happens, um, Chris no longer has control over some of the functions of his wheelchair. One of the other big problems is that the cost of these things is just so high. 
the, these little touch switches have only got a few dollars worth of parts in them, but to buy one touch switch for this particular wheelchair is almost 500 US dollars. So by the time you add a couple of touch switches, that's a really prohibitive cost for most people. So, we decided to do something about that. Yeah. Um, so we started to decide how hard to open source touch switch. Chris's original idea was that because changing the batteries was so annoying, he really wanted a version that was similar to the existing design, but it just had a really high capacity battery in it, so that if you're changing the battery maybe every year or so, it would be far less annoying than having to do it about every month. But then we decided that since the chair has plenty of power anyway, and it's got this big battery pack, it's designed for running motors, um, what we can do is just take power directly from the chair. So at the moment we're working on a prototype for a version of a touch switch which is functionally equivalent to the one that is on Chris's chair right now. But it will take power from the chair so there will never be any need to change batteries. Then it would be a lot cheaper. <laughs> Definitely. So a lot. A few years ago, the good friend to be a dick. So we did. He passed away. Did his father donate it to these tiny cheaters? These haters. What they do. So if you've ever gone out on a really cold day and your hands have been really cold and then you've got a pen and tried to write something, you've probably had a lot of trouble you know, moving accurately because your fingers just don't work properly. Now for someone who is driving a wheelchair, they have the exact same problem. The, um, the wheelchair control in Chris's case is a joystick which requires very fine motor um, movement in order to control it accurately. So Nick and Chris would have lots of difficulty going out on a cold day when their hands get cold, they couldn't control the wheelchair properly anymore. So the little hand heaters help relieve that problem. By mounting them on the chair just near uh, their hand, it blows warm air over their hand and then allows them to keep control of the wheelchair. Uh, the little hand heaters that they were given a couple of years ago um, aren't available anymore in Australia. I think they used to be and you can still buy them in some places overseas. But we really wanted to be able to make them available for people who um, could benefit from them. So what we did was design um, these little hand heaters. Uh, this steel case was all, uh, was it laser cut or what? Yeah. Laser cut. So um, Nick designed the, um, the physical case for this and it was all laser cut and then bent. So it's in a nice solid um, container. And these are designed to mount either on the chair permanently and Chris has one mounted just down near his right hand or they can be put on um, common mounts like a GoPro mount and then put in a convenient place. So what Chris often does is have these sitting on his desk uh, when he's using the computer, they can be blowing onto his hands so that he maintains dexterity and doesn't get cold hands. So I think these have made a, a really big difference in, in your difference. comfort and ability to get that, around. That's... We wanted to give to other people that ability as well. But they're difficult, difficult to get. And, um, 
Bullock. It's impossible. <laughs> yep. To get ten dub. They're expensive. Hmm. Like, like pretty much all assistive technology, as we've discovered, it it all seems to be ridiculously overpriced. So we want to be able to do something about that. Just down here, you can see the hand heater. It's mounted to the frame of the wheelchair down on this little um, adjustable arm and it's set up so that it blows directly on Chris's hand when it's sitting over the joystick and that way his hand stays nice and warm. The, um, the heater itself gets power from the chair. There's a plug in the back here and a cable that goes in through the chair and then just along the side here is a control panel and uh, this can be used to turn the heater on or off and adjust its heat level as well. It has multiple modes so it can blow at different strengths and um, generate different amounts of heat. Chris controls his wheelchair using a little joystick which is mounted down here on the frame. It's a special type of joystick which requires very low force to activate because it has Hall effect sensors and a magnet. Um, what that means is that he can move the joystick full deflection with very small force. It's also extremely accurate so it only moves a few millimetres to get full scale from uh, on any particular axis. And what we wanted to be able to do was use the, um, the output from this joystick to control other things. So what we figured is that because Chris can't activate a normal joystick, uh, like on a remote control transmitter, if we could use the signal from this joystick and substitute it into whatever device we want to control, it would allow um, Chris to take control of it. To put a bill, play for Tommy's, to fire up, to wake up, to wake up, to miss the fly, to radio, to drop plates, to drive. Cars. Up. Quite good. Up. But, um, sadly, we lost the ability. But now, we've been working on a device that will hopefully Give me back the ability to fly. Time a Fusion 360 Nerd Plus G.I. Good job designing this aircraft. Now, um, this one flies. It's amazing, eh? But, um, I would like the ability to fly it myself. Uh, this is Nick's old wheelchair, which we're using at the moment for prototyping on this control system. Normally the signal from the joystick on the chair comes up this cable and it runs into the chair's controller. So that's how it gets the, um, the direction and acceleration signal. So what we've done is disconnected the joystick and run the cable through onto a board connected here. There is an Arduino Mega inside this box and what it's doing is reading the signal that comes from the joystick. Now that in itself sounds pretty easy, but it turned out to be trickier than we thought because the output that comes from this joystick is not, it looks like a serial connection, but it's not. And it's an analog signal that varies around a central reference voltage. And the reference voltage is derived from the chair's controller voltage. So what we needed to do was come up with a circuit that would read the reference voltage and then read the, um, the X and Y axes that are coming through the connector and then figure out what the offsets are relative to each other. And that's all done 
on a little circuit board which is inside this box. So the Arduino can then use that to figure out the X and Y deflection of the joystick by reading those, those three analog values. With this system, this is an early prototype. Um, we've got it functioning, but it's cobbled together. There's a lot of hand wiring in it, and it's not very neat. But then what we can do is, once the Arduino can read the joystick from the chair, we can redirect that to some other system. And what we have here is an output that goes from the Arduino into a modified FlySky remote control transmitter. So physically inside the case is a little RC network. And what we're doing is sending PWM values down this cable. They're being filtered inside the box by the RC network. And then that signal is being sent to the transmitter in place of the regular joysticks. And this switch allows us to change modes. So with the, um, with the switch in, the transmitter operates as normal. You can control it just using these joysticks. By flicking the switch out, it accepts its um, stick position coming from the joystick attached to the chair. Now in this case we've only got one joystick but we can actually handle dual inputs so that uh, if for example you wanted to fly a drone then you need three axes so um, the two joysticks allow you to do that. We can have one joystick on one side of the chair and one joystick on the other. The way this is set up right now is fine for doing things like flying a glider because you only need two axes and it also works pretty well for controlling things like a combat robot. Hello, I've um, been working on this system for a while. Uh, it, uh, with John and um, basically it takes the analog output from the wheelchair joystick it allows you to uh, um, switch it so you can plug in like a game controller or a uh, you can use it to fly radio controlled uh, devices uh, like drones or planes or cars but uh, there's all sorts of other more useful functions that it could do. Um, like perhaps driving an actual car. With this early version, we have and we have analog signals coming out of the Arduino here, going into the transmitter. But what we want to do is totally change the architecture. So we've been working on an updated version. This is a little board which will be added into the back of the transmitter. It's uh, got a CAN bus interface on it. So what this will effectively do is add CAN to the FlySky transmitter. And there will be a CAN connector on here in place of this connector and then we'll be able to plug into it and send commands to the transmitter which will um, basically dictate the stick positions. So we're just working on that. Um, I've just received the PCBs for this and put the parts on, started populating it, but I haven't got all of this powered up and working yet. And this is a replacement for this box which brings the input in from the, um, the joystick on the wheelchair and it sends the output. So instead of sending an analog output, what this one does is take the input from the chair and it has uh, pass through. So what we can do is put this in series with the chair control system and then switch modes uh, from here. So you can have this permanently attached to the chair instead of having to attach it and disconnect it. Um, this can be permanently connected and when you want to use the chair, have the switch in one position. When you want to send the signal somewhere else, flick the switch and uh, it's got a couple of connectors on here for CAN bus and the idea is that what we can do is use the joystick from the wheelchair 
to control the chair, but also to send messages over CAN bus, which can then be used for controlling other devices. So by combining these two systems, what we can do is take the chair um, joystick input here, send it onto the chair control system, have CAN bus coming out of here, and send that to the FlySky transmitter. And what that means is that we can use different input devices. This particular one is set up for the joystick from the chair, but we could also do devices like a button box which sends CAN events, and um, we could do foot controls and um, like sip and puff controls for people that need different types of input devices. We're going to do more videos in the future showing more detail about some of these projects. So if you want to stay up to date with that, make sure you subscribe. I'm going to put links in the video description both to the Superhouse channel and to Chris's channel. So if you want to learn about Fusion 360 and see some of the cool things he does, make sure you um, subscribe to Chris's channel. And um, if you can support our work on Patreon, that would be fantastic as well. It'll help us to keep working on these devices and make them available for more people. So thank you very much and um, go and build something cool. Yeah.